Hi, everyone. Welcome to our tonight's event, Biocolor Splashes Engaging with Materiality and Color. It's really nice to see you all here with safety distances, but still many of you, so thank you for coming. My name is Riikka Alanko, and uh, I am the interaction coordinator of the Biocolor project. Is Biocolor project completely new to, new to you, or have you heard about it before? Who has heard about Biocolor before? Okay, yeah, maybe you are like active followers and or maybe working on the field. It, it will be interesting to hear your questions or comments on tonight's themes as well later. Well, uh, Biocolor project uh, is uh, coordinated by uh, University of Helsinki and uh, it is funded by Strategic, uh, Strategic Research Council. And uh, Today we are covering uh, some, some interesting perspectives or points of view to color and materiality. You can see the program of tonight from there and see the speakers and speeches. So we'll be uh, covering critical design aspects, um, also uh, cons conservatory uh, studies, so more historical aspects of colors and their materiality. Then we have a consumer study, uh, studies aspects and also packaging, packaging industry aspects covered tonight. Uh, before continuing or uh, welcoming our first speaker, I just want to introduce you uh, the interaction tools tonight. You people who are here live, you can uh, ask questions at any point, but uh, now I also want to welcome all the audience who is online uh, uh, seeing the live streaming. So for you, we have created a chat channel at presemo.helsinki.fi slash biocolor. So you can leave comments and questions there, and after uh, each speech I will uh, post those questions to the speakers. So, maybe before further, without further ado, uh, I want to welcome Riikka Raisanen, the leader of the Biocolor project, to give a short introduction uh, about Biocolor. So, welcome Riikka. Okay. So, hello everybody and um, uh, you are very welcome to come, uh, come and hear about our project. So, Biocolor started last year and uh, we have been doing research uh, one year now, so it's kind of one year anniversary event, this Biocolor slash is here. So uh, the program will go on uh, six years altogether, so till 2025. And our aim is to develop new methods for biocolor and large-scale utilization and production. And we also want to study the fundamental characteristics of uh, natural compounds and nat natural dyes. Also uh, to build novel processes and uh, sustainable items. So we have also uh, partners uh, participating in our project. And uh, what we want to do is to get a full uh, color palette of dyes and uh, pigments for uh, uses such as textile packaging and coatings. So we have kind of... Um, uh, um, focused on certain um, um, applications in, in our research, at least at, at the beginning. And uh, what is important is that we want to collect the information of biocolorants which we get during this research project and uh, establish a biocolorant database which will be open and for use all researchers and also those interested in natural colorants um, uh, in, in uh, industry or in, in handicrafts, arts, and so on. 
So also, uh, since we got this um, uh, financing from the Strategic Research uh, Council in Finland, uh, based in the Academy of Finland, the one important thing in this uh, funding is the interaction with different stakeholders. And our um, interaction um, groups are kind of listed here uh, with whom we want to uh, interact and um, create new knowledge. So scientific community, students, associate, um, associates, business partners, we have uh, named business partners in our, um, uh, in our application, but of course we are uh, open for, uh, for all um, uh, suggestions and we want to uh, create a biocolor network and uh, build connections between different actors on this field. Also research participating lead consumers we are doing studies on how uh, consumers uh, negotiate with, with biocolorants. It's their characteristics are different from those of uh, synthetic dyes. So if you are interested in participating our uh, research, you can send us an uh, email and we will contact you. Also, later on, uh, we want to uh, interact with uh, authorities and policymakers, and those we will uh, do together with other research projects uh, funded in this program. And of course, broad audience is important. We are interested in, in your opinions, and we want to share the information which we have received through our research. And we believe that first-hand participation personal experiences and activity are the, are the key, key uh, actions with uh, all of these audiences that can make the difference and can make the change in, in our, our lives and for the future. So, yeah, then there are, there are um, workshops. Uh, we are... Um, um, organizing exhibitions and uh, also uh, write um, articles and um, such so you can follow us also in our, our channels. And today we will hear more about uh, art exhibitions, uh, for example, from Julia and, and how art can be a key for, for, for persons to, to think uh, diverse things on, in a new way. So, um, what we have proceeded uh, so far, so we have three uh, sources, agricultural uh, uh, plants, fungi, forest industry, and then microbes for the sources of biocolorants. Uh, we do um, develop extraction methods and uh, fully characterize the dyes we are developing. Uh, we also want to study the toxicological aspects and healthy aspects of these dyes developed. And we have uh, especially researchers at the University of Eastern Finland and uh, in Brazil, in the University of, of uh, Campinas, who have studied uh, environmental and human toxicity. Then we, when we discover safe dyes, uh, we study their properties in different applications, uh, we have done already some larger scale dyeing experiments, of course, lab scale dyeing experiments, also uh, studied uh, the natural dyes properties in some plastics or thermo thermoplastic um, um, materials, and we want 
to develop also processes so that they are more sustainable and environmental friendly and we like to either use low water uh, processes or even waterless processes such as uh, using uh, uh, supercritical carbon dioxide in, in the, as a media. And uh, then in, the, in one work package we study the environmental, ethical, societal aspects of production, consuming biocolorants, and also new aesthetics. So um, a lot of this adaption of natural dyes and their di different hues uh, depend on how consumers accept such broad broad Ducts. So this is also important to uh, cope with the consumers already in the very beginning of the processes. And uh, at last we, we then collect uh, information in this biocolorant database, which serves then, uh, of course, our research project, but also uh, other uh, communities. And here are, are um, our research uh, institutes. We are uh, eight institutes and uh, I must say that this uh, cooperation has been very multidisciplinary but very interesting and uh, I think when, when different fields meet, then something new, new uh, is happening. So I hope you all uh, enjoy today's evening and I welcome you and I want to give the floor to our exciting um, speakers. And thanks already for everyone for their talks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Riikka. Does anyone uh, has some questions for Riikka at this point? If not, we can uh, welcome our first speaker. So uh, let me welcome Julia Luhmann, a professor of practice in contemporary design in Aalto University and a researcher in biocolor project. So, yeah, welcome. I Great. Meet you. Thank, thank you very much, <laughs> Rika. Yes, fantastic. So, welcome everybody online and in person here, especially. It's very nice to see people for real sitting here. Um, today, I've prepared a presentation with my work, but with a very specific angle to my work, because I think what we're doing in a research project, especially in a multidisciplinary research project, is generating data and very interesting kind of uh, research results. But as we're dealing with biocolors and with colorants and dyes, it's not enough to just write academic papers and to you know have graphs and have this very dry and very coded output for academia, I think. We should really use the most of these materials to engage people into, you know, into a multisensorial experience through which they can be engaged with the topics we're dealing with. So this will be the angle of my talk, and I'm going to talk a little bit about projects that I have done throughout the last 15 years and what was specific and special with them in terms of audience engagement. To make us think about how we can translate the scientific data we're generating and the samples we're generating and how we can make them experienceable on a multisensorial level. Yeah. So I'm starting with a very old piece that I did in 2001, almost 20 years ago now, when I was still a student and graduating from my bachelor course. Back then, my husband had already graduated into a similar situation that we are facing today. There were no jobs, or all the jobs were for web designers, and everyone kept telling him, you should have an exhibition. And he said, yeah, so what? You know, should I just walk into Tate Modern and have an exhibition? 
And we thought, yeah, let's do that. And back then I was working with the themes of growth and decay. And we were together working with these maggots because a maggot grows by decaying something. And we were very playfully, you know, we, we got maggots in the bait shop and we were putting them on paper and realizing that they have amazing movements and that if we introduce color with them, um, we can actually track these movements and make them um, experienceable. And I think this is one of the things you can do with color. You can make things time-based. They fade, they come to life, they leave traces, they change over time. I think that's one of the strengths that you can do with colors. So we walked into the Tate Modern, uh, into the top floor where there were no uh, security cameras, no CCTV, no artworks we could damage. And we put up um, a washing line between two pillars and maggot artwork where we placed the maggots, had placed the maggots on different locations and had them tra leave traces on the maps. But we also had an artist interview where we asked the maggots questions and they would leave ink trails on paper and answer the question. So we would select one artist and say, do you consider yourself male or female? And then it would say, male, female, male. What is your name? Dick, in that case. What's your favorite food? Are you looking forward to becoming a fly? Uh, what do you, how do you feel right now? And so forth. And it was super interesting because we were not presenting a finished outcome, but we were involving people into a process. And that process was actually changing the audience themselves. So they would come in and be like, oh, maggots, disgusting. And the minute there was one maggot answering all these questions, they came closer and closer. And at the end, very often they asked, what happens with Dick now? You're not going to kill him, right? And it was amazing to see how a shared process, a process of discovery, could engage an audience in a very, very different way than showing a finished piece. The maggots, of course, did transform into flies that were much harder to handle. And I ended up graduating with that poster of the Union Jack made in scrap meat with um, flies breeding on it, I thought, but they were all dying on it, which was very sad. But I included it in this presentation because I think it's also this aspect of letting the work change you and you not deciding everything in advance, but actually going with the flow and understanding what happens. I didn't plan to make a Union Jack there. I was planning to breed maggots in the colors red and blue and white that are then kind of in the shape of the Union Jack and it looks like a flag moving and the maggots are moving actually. But it ended up becoming this picture. So I think we should share processes but we should also be informed and kind of let, give ourselves to the processes we are doing and see what they afford, what they allow us to communicate. So it's about making the new known or making the known new. And I think if we think about this, every time we're showing something, what am I doing? Am I making the new known or am I making the known new? It's interesting because quite often when we show very commonplace objects or colors or whatever, um, and people haven't thought about what that means and we show them an aspect of something they have every day in their hands, it's a different process than showing them something completely new. But which way around do we want this process of discovery happen? This year is a sheep stomach that um, I turned into a beautiful lace-like lamp and people were amazed by its beauty and because I completely decontextualized it from the animal, from the kitchen, from everything we associate with a sheep stomach, people could see it for the first time. And then they would realize, oh my God, it's a sheep stomach. And they would very often be a little bit disgusted. And there was this moment of, oh, but I just felt something completely different a minute ago. Why am I disgusted now? And which is the real kind of true self? What is society telling me and what is me having an experience? And I love these moments of changing somebody's mind, like changing just the perception of something and then after this, there will be this moment of reflection of, but what, what did I see there? What did I feel there? 
I took this picture, or actually my husband took it, when I was going to work at Alto University, because I think often people who don't work with materials don't realize what it really entails. This is a professor going to work <laughs> with some of her materials. And I find it so important if we deal with color and with materialities that we don't try to hide this, that we try to embrace it. Because I think through our bodies and through our experiences in our bodies, we are part of nature. Uh, I think our bodies, for example, sauna, I think, is a nature experience. It's just the nature inside us rather than outside us. And we are the strangest of all animals because we have developed an intellect with which we can see in the microsphere and into universe. We can see into the future and into the past. And that's our intellectual advancement that kind of makes us unique. But our bodily experiences make us completely part of nature. And in these moments when you really carry stuff around, you just feel that, you just feel humble and um, yeah, you feel the fallacy of life. So a lot of my work involves translating science into something perceptible. And again, there we have these different scales very often, because the scientific discovery might be on a micro scale, and you only can see it through a microscope, and you can, it's very hard to translate it into everyday life. So uh, this is a piece where I was trying to bring these two scales into one piece. Um, it was for the Wellcome Trust in London, and basically if we... Um, nine out of ten living cells in our bodies are not human cells, but other organisms. That was the basis of this piece. So how much of us is actually us, and how much are we an ecosystem? So I commissioned a um, microbiologist to breed the three most common bacteria from all parts of the human body for me and photograph the cell colonies. And then I would make the cell colonies into Photoshop brushes and apply them in the positions where they occur to the percentage where they occur. And when you walk on the side directly in front, you just see the cell colonies. And when you're going on a bus, you see these very classical pictures of the reclining nude figure that is made exactly just of the cell colonies rather than human uh, cells. So here the, the structure was the Petri dish. The Petri dish as, a, as the metaphor through which we experience that micro world. So I believe that very often we are making exhibitions in which the materials are not allowed to speak. The materials sometimes only come in as an afterthought. You want to say something and then, yes, it needs to be in a material. But if we are dealing with color, if we're dealing with materiality, it should be at the forefront of what we're thinking. The material should guide us into what we want to say. And if we are sharing processes and not dealing with a precious object, we can use all senses, we can engage people with all senses. They can touch, they can smell, they can even taste, you know, they can be really embedded in the exhibition. It's gotten a lot harder now with COVID, of course, but... Um, so basically, I've been working with seaweed for the last 10 years because it's incredibly... Um, I don't know, it's... it's it got a material character that is very um, strong and very reactive. So it grows six meters long and 30 centimeters wide in one year. It's sticky, it gives the whole room its own smell. Um, it engages in a way that very few other materials automatically do. Um, because when people see an exhibition made of seaweed and they smell the sea, immediately they share stories of walking on the beach, of going to Asian restaurants, um, and they are in this mode of reacting that includes them, rather than looking at a piece and feeling you intellectually have to engage it. So here are some of the seaweed samples where I've tried to dye them with natural colors, uh, on the left, it's kind of a Swedish uh, seaweed just pulled out of the water. And you can already see that, this, that it has such a beauty in its 
uh, unfinished state that is almost more about keeping that beauty alive than um, adding something, making something complete. So here is a piece that I made for the Victorian Albert Museum in the Victorian Albert Museum, and it is talking about this material agency. It's almost a portrait of my engagement with the material. Between each of the rods of rattan, you see one piece of seaweed glued, and the seaweed is glued when it's wet, and it shrinks the whole piece into its final form. And then, of course, because it's still a natural material, it will change over time. So this is 2015, the last picture was 2013. In the two years, it completely changed into another piece. It actually went much faster, in six months. And because the, the chlorophyll is degraded by the UV light and it just bleaches, basically. So I think this is also something that in many of our research projects we're trying to circumvent, we're trying to not fade something, we're trying to make it work um, and make it stable, but maybe when we're communicating we can actually embrace that feature of it fading, of it changing, and really design for that change and with that change. So in 2017 I had the Department of Seaweed at the Victorian Albert Museum and it was all about that process from not knowing, to sensing, to testing, to knowing. And we didn't have any finished objects. We basically worked on the... Uh, we basically said the Department of Seaweed deals with seaweed because it is as important as a material of making as textiles or silverware or ceramics. But most of what we will have made from seaweed has not been made yet. So it's a speculative department that looks into the future and co-imagines what kind of things we will be making from seaweed in the future. And it offered a multiple access points to people. So they could come in and they would be like, oh, my grandmother had this sewing machine. That's the connection. Or, mmm, that smells amazing. I'm going to break off a little bit of your material stack to taste. And it enabled people, this is the next piece that I did at the World Economic Forum, but it enabled people to look at the piece from their own vantage point, connect with it, and then start a dialogue around it. Um, this is the internal structure of the Hidako Omo. That was at the World Economic Forum in January. So basically, on the back you see the Hidaka Omu, that piece um, um, we made in which you can walk in and completely be embraced by the sculpture, really having a multisensorial uh, experience within uh, a conference center that is very, very different. And in the front we had this workshop where the dialogue would happen, where we would discuss seaweed and everyone could start from their own perspective. So I think enabling people to access a piece and have that dialogue from their own perspective and communicate back to you, creating a research loop, like a feedback loop, is very important when you are um, communicating through materials. Because if I look into the future, what we could make with seaweed, this is the future cone, I see probable and possible solutions, but it's quite two-dimensional. But if we all look from different perspectives, and if I create a lens through which people can look into the future, and if we then also share the same values of what kind of future we would like, is sustainability at the core of it? You know, what, what kind of seaweed farming do we need in this planet? Then suddenly we have a multitude of options and the shared um, vision will help us um, pull together towards some of the desirable ones. So I think an engagement with materiality and with colors and with processes could be multisensorial. It should combine the poetic and the factual and make science perceptible. It should give multiple access points and engage body and mind. It should be about enabling the material's voice, not making it silent, but really pushing it to the forefront. It should be relational storytelling, meaning that it 
picks up on where the visitor came from and helps them go one next step. It should be about sharing a process and making that accessible. Very often, especially as scientific processes, still remain unaccessible to non-specialists if you are just sharing the data. It's very hard to make them accessible, but it's possible through materiality. And I think, at best, it's co-speculative, so that it can offer us feedback on our own work and that it can be a research feedback loop, as well as like not dissemination in one direction, but actually in multiple directions. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Julia. Are there any no. immediate questions? Yeah, we have a time for questions. And before asking uh, from our audience here, uh, I, want to, I, I want to remind uh, the audience online that you can leave questions um, typing address Prisimo presemo.helsinki.fi slash biocolor. I'm sorry that I don't have it in, in a written mode here, but uh, prisimo.helsinki.fi slash biocolor. So we can have shortly questions from there too, if you, if you are uh, giving those. But in the meantime, uh, do you have some questions? our audience here, for Julia about uh, her projects, about engaging uh, through materials and materiality. This one. <laughs> how do you The question was how I make up the names of the sculpture. Um, it's always a process, yeah, it, it should be poetic as well as having a deeper meaning. So, for example, the oki naga node, oki means big in Japanese, and it's Japanese seaweed we're using. It's naga seaweed we're using, and the node is the knot. But also oki naga node, naga node, could also be a Japanese name of a collaborator, because it felt like collaborating with the material. Yeah, so, so there's a story behind each of the names. Okay, now I actually have a question here online. Mm -hmm. So to Julia, when working with bio-beings, how do you feel, especially at the beginning of the project? Uh, did you have any hard moments that prevented you uh, momentarily working with them? Maybe this is more focused on the maggots or on the seaweed? Yes, there is, yeah, <laughs> there is always this hard moment of um, feeling disgust myself or feeling I, I always am very emotionally engaged in the process and I actually like this moment of discovery of my own limit and then figuring out why that is and questioning. And for example, with the maggots, it was really funny because we became very attached to them over working with them. So I was releasing them in parks and, you know, trying to not kill them, trying to give them a life afterwards, which is quite... Weird. So, so I yeah. very often, a lot of the things I'm doing is repeating or finding ways of sharing an own process of discovery that has me engaged emotionally and intellectually. Yeah. Good question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so too. Uh, yeah, I think your presentation was really fascinating and uh, uh, at least for me it provoked a lot of thoughts about the voice of natural dyes, if, if one can say so. And you said about uh, kind of a reinforcing and uh, uh, giving space for the voice of the material. So in a way, maybe natural dyes could have more of a voice than some mm -hmm. chemical, chemical com compounds or, uh, well, of course, natural dyes are often chemical compounds as well. But uh, yeah. do you have some thoughts on that? Yeah, I have because... Of course, if we, on one hand, if we want our work to matter, it needs to enter the big production cycles for it to matter at the scale we need it to matter at. But at the same time, they require the materials to be so uniform that they are almost, 
you know, it, it almost needs to have less of a voice. So I think there is a comparison with craft, for example, with artisans who are picking the gnarled wood that has this especially beautiful bend, and they are bringing out that bend of the wood. And then with industrial production, where you actually have to create MDF out of the wood to make it uniformly go through, and every piece needs to be the same. But maybe, especially biocolorants, offer us a possibility of of actually creating mass-produced items that still have that unique character. And we should try and embrace that and try and make that acceptable. And I think this project is a lot about that as well, about you know, how can we make people want that and cherish that there are 10 different shades on the shirts that they have in front of them and they have to pick the one that's for them, basically. Yeah, yeah so. That's a really important point of view and, and uh kind of a task of our <laughs> project as well. Yeah. Mm, yeah, there is another question here. Uh, someone is uh, watching with great interest in Japan. Uh, here seaweed is food. How about, uh, how about in Finland? <laughs> <laughs> it's becoming more popular as food over the last years. But I think that's exactly why you needed a foreigner coming to Japan. It, it started with me being in Japan at the fish market. The whole project started there, saying, oh my God, what do you make of it? And then the Japanese person saying, oh, we've, we've been eating it for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And because my blinkers are European blinkers, I was thinking immediately when I saw it that there must be a craft around it. And it's almost like you would work with lasagna plates here or something. Like Japanese people were super surprised that I work with their food. But because for me it wasn't embedded as such as food so much, it was an amazing leather-like material straight away. Yeah. Yeah, so it's becoming more popular, but we don't have as great seaweed here as you do there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Do you have still... Uh or do we have some questions here? Not online at the moment. So maybe we can proceed with the program. Thank you so much, Great. Julia. Thank you very much. <laughs> so our next speaker is Martin van Bommel. Uh, he's a professor of conservation science in University of Amsterdam and we'll be having Martin with us uh, via Zoom. So let's check that Martin is ready. Hello Martin. Hello. I Hello. Uh, hope you are enjoying over there. <laughs> yes, great to have you here. So everything is fine. Uh, I'll give the stage, <laughs> so to say, to you. So, uh, welcome. Yeah, thank you very much. So, today I will uh, explain about uh, the application and uh, particularly uh, aging and degradation of natural dyes applied in field of cultural heritage. So, it's, a, uh, I think, a completely different topic than uh, what was just presented. Um, so uh, it's good to realize that uh, dyes are, of course, widely applied in cultural heritage. Uh, textile dyeing was already done in the prehistory, uh, and dyers were aware of the fastness properties of these dyes. Uh, in addition, it's also good to realize that nowadays the objects we are looking at, we are studying, are basically, well, let's say, the proper uh, stuff, the good stuff. So very precious textiles, uh, for example, which were uh, had a religious uh, purpose or costumes from noble, from royals, from kings, etc. Uh, and the clothing of the common people normally uh, did not survive. Sometimes you find it in archaeological sites, but then they are often very deteriorated due to the archaeological condition. So uh, if you investigate dyes applied on uh, objects of cultural heritage, you might be a little bit biased. That is something to uh, keep in mind. Uh, of course, today I will not give you a complete overview of all the work I, uh, I did because I need a complete week for that. So I will have a short introduction. I decided to focus on a few case studies, uh, just a very few, uh, which are, I think, quite illustrative 
of how dyers were working with their textile dye and were doing the textile dye. Uh, I will also show you two slides about uh, synthetic organic uh, colorants because that is uh, currently one of them uh, a very important topic for me. And then I will uh, conclude. So dyes are of course applied in textiles, uh, but in addition to textiles, and I will mainly focus on textiles today, you can also find them on uh, wood and furniture. If you apply an organic colorant, uh, what you normally have, uh, if you apply it as a stain, you still see the wood structure. And in addition, you can find the same organic colorant also as ink. And in this equation, I show you an image of an iron gallic dye, which is causing iron gallic corrosion. Uh, and obviously, you find it also in historic interiors where you have textiles and furniture, etc. The more modern dyes are, apart from textiles and furniture, also applied in really modern materials, such as plastics. I will not talk about this today. And we all, of course, know about uh, photography. Uh, and it's quite interesting to understand that not only, uh, of course, we have a lot of uh, color photography now, but the uh, early black and white images were sometimes uh, painted in using organic colorants. Well, the dyeing processes uh, of natural dyes are, uh, can be cut, uh, divided into three different processes. Uh, we have direct dyings, which uh, can be relatively easy uh, to dye a textile with. You extract your dye and you apply your uh, textile to the dye bath, and you will get a, a color. So turmeric and saffron and safflower is, are very well-known uh, dyes. Uh, and in general, the vast fastness and also the light fastness is not very good. If you compare it with modern dyes, in that occasion, you have uh, uh, dyeing via metal coordination. So you have a metal such as uh, aluminium or tin, which forms a complex between the colorant on one hand and the textile fiber on the other hand. And as a result, you have a very strong wash fastness, and it also improves, improves the light fastness. And as a matter of fact, for some colorants, they change color. Uh, the hue of the color is changing due to the, uh, depending on the modern used. So very well known are matter and weld. And then the third category are the fat dyes. Uh, basically, these are uh, unsoluble components. You have to bring them into a solution. Uh, and they die then via hydrophobic in, uh, interaction with the textiles, uh, which give, and these dyes in general have a very strong light fastness and a very uh, strong vast fastness, although their rug fastness is uh, not always that good. I think, I'm not sure as a matter of fact, but I think you can use every plant in nature to get a color out of it. Uh, but luckily for me, because we have to do identification of dye stuffs on historical objects without prior knowledge. And luckily for us, not all the dye plants, uh, all plants found uh, in nature uh, gives you a good color. So the total number of dyes uh, used in historical uh, in, uh, cultural heritage are, well, somewhere between 40 and 50. Uh, and I think that only 15, so one five, species are uh, responsible for, let's say, 90% of the dyes you find on, uh, on the cultural heritage objects. So the first case study is a costume uh, attributed to Albertian Elector Moritz of Saxony. Uh, you can see the information over here. It uh, consists of a gown. And if I go to the next image, you also see that there is a doublet over here, a trunk hose and stockings. Uh, this work was carried out in collaboration with, uh, among others, uh, Bettina Nienkamp, and uh, she wrote an excellent uh, publication about it in the Rieke Berg uh, Bericht, which still can be uh, bought online uh, from the Abbe Stifting. And the aim was, as a matter of fact, uh, first of all, to determine the dyeing techniques, and also if we could link the objects to, to each other to see if they really belong uh, to each other right from the start or that they were prepared in a different way. And although, of course, particularly this image uh, seems to be very yellow, there are many other colors uh, present as well, and I will show them. Of course, we first focused on, uh, on the yellow dyes, and the uh, dyes we found over there were uh, Welt and Dyer's Groom, uh, 
uh, in all of the objects. And I must say that in the leather stockings, we also found a quercetin dye, which is still unidentified. Uh, personally, I think that it uh, indicates an, uh, a yellow boot species which was used, but it could be also a marker of uh, sour, which is also a, compo a dye uh, which uh, uh, it, it should be, uh, is supposed to be used. Um, you can see over here typically a sample spot, so we normally take uh, yarns from inside, uh, first of uh, inside an object, first of all, because then you do not really see it if you are uh, looking at the object in an exhibition, for example. But also this is the location where the colorants are best preserved. If you look to the two dyes, they are both uh, present in, uh, in Europe uh, for a very long time. And in the Middle Ages and also later on in the early modern times, they were distributed all over Europe. I'm not so sure if this upper border nowadays are still valid. Maybe the, due to the climate change, you can find them more and more northward. But I think that you from Finland know better than I. Uh, but at least these two dyes are uh, very important, are both biannual plants growing both in the wild, but also cultivated, especially wild was cultivated uh, a lot throughout Europe. Uh, and it's quite interesting to know that in the uh, in recipes or in historical sources, you often find information, oh, dyes boom is of lesser quality than welt. But actually the components, the dyeing components present are luteolin and apigenin and their glucosides, which are of course the same. And there is a third component present, which is colorless in this uh, occasion. Uh, we use it as a marker to identify dyes boom. Uh, but of course, if you look to the chemical structure, if they are the same, you expect that the quality would be the same. And as a matter of fact, this is a kind of true, although dyes broom contains simply less uh, dye material. So the dyes had to uh, adapt to that. So they were stating sometimes, okay, the quality is lower, but basically they mean if you use more plant material to uh, extract the dye from, you can arrive at the same color and uh, of course also with the same light fastness properties. Belt and also dyes broom are responsible for 90% uh, of the yellow dyes used in Europe. So these two dyes are very important. If we then look to the green textile fibers, uh, originally, we didn't thought they uh, should be present, but you see here in the selfage over here, and also in the duplet, you see these green lines, and we uh, analyzed them as well. And we found uh, mixtures of yellow dyes, which could be weld uh, and dyes broom, or maybe together uh, as a mixture, together with both, uh, so the blue uh, indigo dye. Uh, we think it is uh, it is uh, world, but it could be also indigo ferra from uh, uh, from uh, the tropics. It's interesting. I always explain that to my students that if you go outside, and of course you see that everything, uh, all the plants are have green uh, leaves in nature, uh, but the, this green are, is due to chlorophyll, which is not stable. And the moment you extract it from the leaves, it degrades quite fast. And the way of getting a, a stable green was mixing blue and, uh, and uh, yellow. And since the indigos normally show better light fastness, uh, sometimes you see a kind of a bluish green. In this occasion, this is not true because the green we found were inside of the object and therefore protected by light. These are the main uh, components. It's a little bit difficult to distinguish between world and indigo just on dye analysis. Of course, if you look to the plant themselves, they are well, relatively easy to distinguish. But if you have a textile dyed with world or indigo, they cannot be distinguished at the moment because the main colorants are indigo tin and indirubin. And in addition, they uh, you can find sometimes other components as well, but they are present in both species. And particularly for this object, it is quite uh, difficult to determine which one was used because prior to the 16th century, uh, Volt was used, which is native to uh, Europe. And then uh, after the 16th century, uh, indigo was important from the tropics uh, because it had a higher dye content and it was, as a result, therefore cheaper, although they had to import it from uh, far away, but it is a particularly in the 16th century when there was a huge 
well, debate going on about uh, the vote producers were uh, very reluctant to continue with Inigo because they were afraid of their uh, of their own uh, job, so to say, uh, and were complaining that Inigo had a very poor quality, uh, which was actually not true because if you look to the quality, the light fasteners and the wash fasteners, for both of them are, uh, are very similar. Then we also found in the same salvage and also on other areas, red yards. Uh, and in this occasion, we also found yellow dyes. Uh, I wrote here that the yellow dyes could be a cost contamination, but to be honest, I think that there are cost contamination, uh, cost contamination. So uh, the, the yellow, or the red dye, uh, yards are a principal dyed with redwood. A redwood is quite interesting because this comes from the topic, so they are important, uh, both from Asia and later on from Latin America after the discovery. Um, and this is a very unstable dye. Uh, as a matter of fact, the main color, colorant, Brazilian, it is so unstable that often in an uh, object of cultural heritage, you cannot find it anymore. They are gone, so to say. And you can identify redwood by a colorless marker, which was often labeled as a type C component and recently identified by uh, David Becky as uh, Eurolithin C. Uh, this colorless marker is stable. It does not degrade during time. Uh, and it's, as a matter of fact, a component which is used to identify faded redwoods. Um, you can see here an extract we did. Uh, we found in recipes that it is normally dyed in an, uh, in elk, in an uh, neutral or an acid environment, giving you kind of an orangey color, but it can become much redder. Uh, in addition, if you dye in an alkaline dye, you get a, a very nice violet uh, shade, uh, although we did not find any recipes uh, uh, using redwood to dye violet or purple. And it's good to realize that the dyes were uh, new this, uh, so it was used for cheap textiles, so I should, uh, suspect also for uh, clothing for the common people, and it was often used as adulterant, so together with uh, better uh, red dyes, uh, it was added to the dye bath to uh, uh, brighten the color, uh, but of course it fades uh, rapidly. Then about uh, yellow and brown fibers dyes, of course, you cannot really see it over here, but if you see this to this decorative knot, this was uh, taken off the object, you can see that in the back part, that this has a, uh, a darker color than on front. And when we analyzed it, we noticed that it was a mixture of wood and redwood and matter. And we think that the redwood faded away. So originally it was meant to be purple and now it faded away to uh, a more brownish color. Matter was found as well. Uh, this is also a quite interesting plant uh, used for many uh, reds all over Europe. It was not originally native in Europe, but it was uh, introduced from the Southeast of, uh, of uh, Europe. Uh, but cultivated uh, widely since the uh, 7th century. It is good to realize that apart from matter, there were other uh, species containing similar dye stuff, such as the bedstraws, for example, uh, which can grow also up to the north of, uh, of Europe. They're giving the same components, but based on the dating, we think that matter was used in this occasion. And we even found inside the knot some orange yarns, and we identified that uh, as young fustic, which is a yellow wood uh, on an alum mordant. Uh, and one of the components was present in abundance, which gives you a more orange color. Well, normally, this is used to dye yellow. Uh, and this is uh, extracted from what they call the dye schumach or uh, the European smoke tree, which is native into the south. And the last dyes we identify were basically the blacks, which are, of course, pr quite predominant available on the gown. So different blacks were found. First of all, we found uh, more bluish black, which was a mixture of indigo and redwood. Uh, and this was also kind of a surprise because this combination, most likely this world and, uh, and redwood, not indigo, and this combination was quite odd uh, because you can get a very nice uh, black color when mixing red on iron and uh, indigo, but normally they dyed with matter and not with, uh, with redwood. 
uh, still the color is pretty good, which means that most likely this object was preserved quite well. So I think that this was stored mainly from light and only uh, used on very rare occasions. In a brown yarn, on the, uh, which was found on the inside of the gown, we uh, detected uh, tenons on iron and also Persian berries. And if you look to Persian berries or, or, or tenons, this is normally extracted from gel nuts or elder bark or something like that. And this can be uh, used to uh, dye black or brown on the uh, uh, on textiles. And this is also known to be used as an uh, ink in writing. Another case study I worked on uh, for quite a long time are some objects uh, from the Art Historical Museum in Vienna, a collection of the treasure room. The objects are shown over here. I will not discuss, but these are all contains uh, insect dyes, uh, which are also found on other objects. For example, this coronation mantle, which is, I think, one of the objects which is uh, most widely known from the treasure room. It is a huge object. Uh, it is dated as an Arabic inscription. And what we did within this research is where we were trying to find out indeed again about dyeing techniques. And in addition, we also tried to learn if the dyes were using which kind of dyeing technology they used. There were uh, the dyes themselves came from uh, the eastern part of the Mediterranean. We were brought to Sicily to create this object and we were trying to study if they uh, use the same uh, techniques as they used in their, uh, 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 where they originally came from. Now what you see over here is a very uh, smart use of the different colors because in the objects you can, uh, or sorry, in the threads, uh, in the weft in this occasion, which you can, which is visible for the naked eye, they found the, uh, we found the expensive dye chemise, while in the warp, which is partly covered by the weft in this occasion, we found the red wood. And of course, this is not so feasible. Uh, so they use a very cheap uh, dye for those parts which were not feasible, but still it was uh, faded. Uh, I will skip this blue yarn information. Well, the insect dyes are uh, very expensive dyes. They can be found in uh, the southern part of Europe, around the Mediterranean, Camis, and of course, uh, in, uh, in addition, there's also Polish cochineal found uh, and Armenian cochineal. And in addition, uh, also uh, insect dyes are uh, present in Latin America and in India. Uh, we can distinguish from them by uh, chemical analysis. Cochineal is one of the most uh, well-known one and it's still used as a food colorant. Uh, so these are very sweet uh, uh, food uh, candies, so to say. Uh, and it, this is the E number they still used. Um, and in all the insect dyes, or most of the insect dyes, you find antiquinones, such as caminic acid and camisic acid. But what we found in this object were only the camisic acid, camisic acid, which are uh, originating from camis, which is a small insect uh, living on the camis along, uh, along the Mediterranean. But what you then also can find in the inside of the coronation mantle, uh, there was a lining present and the dating of the lining is a little bit unknown. I think it was much earlier than the uh, coronation mantle itself. And I stitched uh, myself some of the images together, uh, not in a very neat way. Uh, and in the different objects we found chemis, but mixed with other dyes in some occasions. For example, over here, you see in the warp that they added a little bit of matter, which is, I think you should uh, consider this as an adulterant, so a cheap replacement. And in this area, uh, most likely a mixture of uh, chemise and polished cochineal was, uh, was used. In uh, this part, uh, both in warp and weft, only chemise was used, while in a lot of parts, uh, they used in both the warp and the weft chemise and added matter to that. If we, we found the same dyes again in, this, uh, in the red uh, sleeves and also in the border over here. So chemise together with red wood, and the red wood was the cheaper one. And if we look to the blue tunica, of which I'm not entirely sure if this is original. We found gold, or maybe indigo, and traces of uh, matter. And we thought, well, maybe this is faded matter. 
But it could be also that matter was added to the vault uh, dye bath, and this was normally uh, done to improve fermentation. It does not affect the color, uh, but still you can find uh, very small traces of matter. The last object in this series is the Alp. Uh, the white silk is uh, definitely a later addition, I think from the 18th century. We were interested in the borders over here, in the violet one. Uh, in the brown yards, we found again tannin, but now uh, in this occasion, we also found tarry in purple, together with tannins uh, in the purple uh, yarns. And we found the same also uh, in this border. And in that occasion, we found in the weft tarry in purple and in the warp, uh, orcho and tarry in purple. And this is quite interesting. I'll skip this a little bit because of the time, we found the same. Uh, materials. It's quite interesting that Italian purple is considered to be uh, the most expensive natural dye. It has a very good light fastness, while uh, Orchil uh, is considered to be a very cheap dye, not nowadays, but in those days, uh, and it has a very uh, poor light fastness, and it was absolutely forbidden to use this. But the, I've shown in this object is that uh, they quite they were very well aware of what they are doing and they used the cheaper dyes in those areas which were not so visible anyway, uh, but they were well uh, cheating a little bit. In some occasions, uh, as for example in this uh, tapestry which was um, uh, investigated by uh, Edith Oberhommer in the supervision of uh, Suzanne Meyer, this is a tapestry from the Rijk Museum in the Netherlands, we found also areas such as this area and I will zoom in a little bit where you can see that on front or on the front uh, you see a blue color while on the back it was much more a violet color and in this occasion uh, they mixed uh, again indigo or maybe gold with the red dyes and we think that the red dyes are now faded and I have another example of that uh, in this uh, tunica you see this meander border over here in some areas, it is discolored, where they use the red root, and in other areas, such as over here and also over here, you still can see the very bright color of uh, uh, obtained by the use of metal and tenants. And in this occasion, uh, we think that this was not deliberately done, uh, but was more a kind of a mistake. Now, this kind of color, this coloration is also observed on uh, on furniture. Uh, particularly in this marquetry. So we studied this, uh, this uh, marquetry. We found uh, uh, traces of dyes which are completely faded now, uh, nowadays. And we made a uh, reconstruction using uh, colored light. I will not go into detail of how we did it. But if you see the object in normal lighting and in the projection, how it should look like, you can see, I also showed from the side, the huge color differences, uh, which is all due to the fact that uh, these poor colorants, these natural colorants, uh, fades heavily on wood. And this is, of course, an object which was often on exhibition. Synthetic colorants, uh, we are, I'm going very quickly to this because I'm running out of time. Uh, we studied a large uh, research project uh, in which we uh, wanted to understand the production and the trade of the synthetic colorants. I have one object I wanted to show you, that is uh, this one. It is uh, designed by uh, Emile Bernard, who is known to be a painter, but also designed embroideries. We found uh, many synthetic dyes, and we could identify most of them. And based on that, uh, also a reconstruction was made. Uh, and this is how it or we think it originally looked like. And this is how it looks nowadays. So to complete, you can obtain a wealth of color. Uh, although you need to be rich because most the best colors uh, uh, were usually very expensive. Uh, the range of dyes they use is quite limited. They use very complex dyeing techniques, uh, but the dyes were normally uh, aware of what they're doing. So they are using those expensive dyes in the areas which are feasible uh, and the cheap dyes in the areas which are not so, not so feasible. And sometimes also we're cheating and added uh, cheap dyes as an adulterant. Uh, and I like to stress again that the research uh, presented today is focused on very precious uh, textiles of a very high quality. So the dyes used for uh, the common clothes uh, uh, 
we have uh, not so much information about that. I like to acknowledge many people involved in the project and I like to thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Martin. I hope you, you could hear at least a little bit of clapping from the audience here at Think Corner. Uh, before uh, asking questions or uh, asking if the audience has questions, I'm going to repeat the address where you can leave questions online. So it is uh, prisimo.helsinki.fi slash biocolor. So you can leave questions from there too. But thank you, Martin. It was really fascinating uh, for having this um, huge time perspective on, on biocolorants and colorants and their uh, non-permanent nature that we've been discussing today. Uh, does some of you here in the audience have questions for Martin? At least not at this point. Okay, one, one hand rises. <laughs> I try to repeat the question. It might be that you didn't hear it. So uh, there was a question uh, whether there has been a black dye done with matter and indigo. Uh, you presented another option with bl uh, redwood. Yes. So uh, is, has there been this other option? And what option do you think uh, is or has been the best for uh, creating black color? Well, using natural dyes, there are uh, two options to get a, uh, a black color. Uh, first is dyeing uh, with using tenons on an iron mordant. Uh, this was uh, often done, uh, particularly in the period when black was really in fashion, on silk, for example. Uh, it can give you a very strong uh, a dark uh, black color. Uh, but sometimes it is not, uh, depending on the ratio of the tenants and the uh, iron uh, present, uh, it can be a very a relatively stable uh, color. Uh, but if the ratio is out of balance, do you have either too much uh, uh, acid tenants, uh, which are quite acidic, or iron, and then you can, uh, it can result in iron corro uh, corrosion. Uh, another technique, which is I think more durable, uh, but also more expensive because it, it simply costs more time and more uh, dyeing is basically, or, or more uh, different dye steps, uh, is mixing uh, blue, uh, red, and also yellows uh, together. So sometimes we found uh, in black dyings uh, all the three colorants together. Okay. And especially if you dye red on uh, most of the red dyes, if you dye them on an iron mordant, it results in a dark red or a brownish color. And then together with, uh, with a yellow and a blue dye, uh, you can have a very beautiful black colors. And these are in general a little bit more stable. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, there are a few questions here online. Uh, first, Mm. Are you asked to study the colors and techniques from these objects, such as the coronation gown, or uh, do you request access to studying them? So, <laughs> uh, who, who motivates <laughs> the study, basically? Sorry? Uh, it was asked uh, whether someone has requested you to study these uh, cultural heritage objects or have you requested to study them? So kind of a who, who has requested the study? I, I, I hear you very, uh, not very well. So uh, there's quite an echo in your microphone. So I do not really uh, get what your question is. It's the question okay. uh, why, with who we are studying this? Yeah, I hope you can hear now. Um, 
it was question about uh, whether you've been requested to uh, do these studies for the cultural heritage objects or have you been the uh, more active uh, kind of a who has <laughs> requested Yeah, yeah the okay, study. I understand. Well, in, uh, in both of the examples I showed you, uh, it was the museum or the conservators who uh, approached me for, uh, for the technical analysis. Uh, it, is often, it is often a kind of a collaboration uh, because you need to find out what kind of research questions there are. Um, and I think that most of the, I, I must say that the piece of furniture was a kind of, uh, uh, was also, as a matter of fact, in collaboration with the museum. Uh, but in that occasion, we were also pushing uh, ourselves a little bit because we were working on, uh, on synthetic colorants and natural colorants applied to furniture. Uh, so it's always in collaboration and who takes the initiative varies a little bit. But uh, I think that in most of the occasions, the initiative comes from the, from the machine. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we are kind of uh, running out of time and now there are questions appearing. I try to choose still some question. Mm. This might be, it might be interesting. Uh, actually, two questions that are kind of intertwined. Uh, other is, how do you define best colors? So, uh, <laughs> this might be <laughs> a too big of a question. And uh, another question is that, is there any way to preserve the natural color better from the colorants that have poor light and wash durability? Maybe to, to do... Yeah, yeah, they are kind of connected. So, uh, yeah, what is the best color? That depends, of course, of, of your aim. Uh, some colorants are uh, very good in giving you brilliant, uh, very nice colors, but they are not durable. So they are best in giving you a color, but not necessarily on the long term. Uh, I think that we are mainly interested in, uh, in light fastness and in wash fastness. Light fastness, because if you put objects on exhibition, you, of course, want to avoid that they change during time. Wash fastness is also an issue. Of course, the objects are not regularly washed anymore. Uh, uh, but sometimes you need uh, conservation treatment. You need to get uh, rid of, uh, for example, of dust or dirt. And then you need to know if the colorants are, uh, are, are wash fast. Uh, and uh, well, uh, one of the best ways, of course, to prevent uh, colors for uh, changing is uh, not exposing them to light. Uh, but that in that occasion also means that you cannot put them on exhibition. So there are quite strict guidelines of uh, how to present objects with a minimum amount of light uh, and also for short periods. So particularly what you see with textiles, particularly the precious textiles that are often uh, only on display for a very short time, let's say three to six months. And then bring it brought back to the uh, uh, storage depot uh, for a decade or so. Yeah. Thank you. It's a pity that we <laughs> need to move on. There are a few questions. Uh, maybe we can find a way to answer those later. But right now, uh, I thank you, Martin. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> and we can welcome our ne next speaker, Minna Autio, who is present here. So, Minna Autio is a professor of home economics uh, at the University of Helsinki and also researcher in the BioColor project. Thanks. Uh, and now okay. you are talking about the consumer views on packaging materials and colors. Let's switch here. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Here we go. <laughs> so, nice to be here. Uh, and uh, my point of view is a bit different than the others, but I think it's referring to Julia's argument quite, quite a lot when I was uh, listening to your, your presentation. Uh, we have been, my presentation is based on the interviews that we have been doing with the consumers. They are also craft hobbyists, which which meant that when you are interviewing such a person who know, th know about colors and, and, and the components, you quite easily realize that, that the informant is much more 
uh, capable of discussing these issues than the researcher, because my background is just consumer research I'm doing in different topics, but we also interviewed kind of ordinary consumers that we get kind of mapping the idea what people are thinking about colors. So this is uh, what we have been doing. We are four of us been conducting these studies. So the first thing, of course, we were interested about what people thinking about colors. You know, if, if you meet a person that you don't know and then you start talking about colors and then we thought that, okay, we ask when they know these colors in their life, in their everyday life. And then the first consumers were saying that traffic lights and we were like, okay, this is not going very well. It's like, but what they're thinking? And then we realized that, yeah, actually it's quite important to, to notice the traffic life if you want to live safety in this planet. But of course there are textiles, food stuff, hair dyes, cosmetics, paint, art, ink, icon painting, you know, what, what people, you know, it's what their hobbies and how they think about and how they perceive the paintings. But of course, when then we go to the consumption and, and markets and, and, and the products and, and like services as well, of course we know that brands are really important in, in people's life, like company colors, like our university, we know what kind of colors, and with fac faculty colors, we are at the University of Helsinki, sport teams, uh, political party. Actually, colors are guiding our life quite a lot, but of course, we are not aware of these ideas because it's, it's, we are not cognitively thinking about these issues. And then if we pick up the one color, like green, it's ecological, it's a green party, it's a green product, it's a chlorophyll, it's a permission to go forward in, in the traffic lights. So one color has so many, many meanings for us in, in our everyday life. But then if I, I'm talking about food packages. We have also conducted um, interviews about clothes, textiles, colors, bio colors, and, and food packages. So this is the, about 40 people we have been interviewed. But if you look, look the literature, what have been doing in the food packages or packages, of course, environmental impact is important. You know, how many, um, how, what's the burden for the environment if we think about packages? But if we come to the idea of food packages, the result is saying that it's actually the food waste is more harmful than the package itself. So that's what we know from the literature. Uh, consumer appreciate who, who doesn't, easy recycling of packages, which is not really, it's not, fulfilling in everyday life, because I think in our, my household and, and the others, we are constantly discussing uh, which trash bin this item is going. Is this plastic or do you think that it's carb, you know, carb or no, carbon or what? what and, and then try to figure it out. And then if you don't know, then you put it in the, in the uh, trash bin, where, uh, which is not recycled, it's burned, or I don't know what they're doing it. And of course, cleaning the easiness is, is the one, one issue for consumers. So the one kind of, if you look at our data, I think the usability is the key issue, which we don't face in, in, if you think about computers or whatever consumer products, we are always struggling with them, how to open them, it's how to get rid of them, how to buy them. It's really a lot of um, work to be done as a consumer to, to, to use these things but it's size, possibility, how you, get, how you live with them with your uh, home. If you buy a package and it, you cannot fit it in the cupboard, it's, it's a bit, bit of a problem. So these are the things that people are thinking when they think about um, packages and, and food packages. But then if you think about packaging and colors, of course the marketing science has been doing a lot about brands. You know, a certain brand, a certain color, what the consumers are thinking about. That you can find quite a lot of studies. But if you think there is a one Finnish study in this Arvola, it's like one example of, of color that it could be seen as environmentally friendly, even it's not green because it's, a, it's, it's a brown and it's, a, you know, it, it's look a bit dull. It's usually also, also clothes. When it's not so much colors, it's more like felt like more environmentally friendly. Uh, and then about packages uh, and, and food packages, there has been a long discussion about uh, the silent salesman in the 1960s at least. 
uh, you know, it's, we are living with uh, these food packages in our own milk, uh, butter, uh, whatever kind of uh, things that they are standing in our fridge and our, our home, in, in, the, in the table and so forth. But then in, when we're coming to the colors again, I, I think, of course, it's attractiveness and it attracts people. That's why they are important for the parties and brands and, and also university as such. But I think this, the most important thing is how they communicate, what Julia was discussing in the earlier on. It's how you communicate colors with your, uh, with your clients or how people communicate or relate to the different kind of uh, colors. So I would like to see package, at least in the future, more like serving consumer, not as, a, as being part of the salesperson in, in your home, but product information also uh, Maybe we could create packages that give hints for a more sustainable way of behaving at home and, and how to get rid of the food waste. Or maybe in the future, what kind of colors your packets are, are consist of, for example. I don't know, we will see after this project. So, and then biocolors and consumer products. That has been really hard <laughs> thing to find out because there isn't really a literature on, you know, if you think about consumer studies, it's, it's still, uh, I haven't found very many empirical research, only master theses in Finland. But of course, when we come to the food, for example, there, like we learned from Martin's uh, um, presentation, there was these cakes. So of course, this food and insects and, and, and food research, it seems to be kind of, it's not emerging, it's, it's going on all the time, because everything we swallow, we kind of take more seriously than, than what we wear, for example. Um, there was this one study, uh, 2009, about, um, uh, you know, it's, 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 uh, he's speculating about the healthiness of the color. So it's, it's very in the general level, but Nobody's really going detailed what people think about it. Actually, we have a lot of data on that and we are writing article, but it's not uh, this um, uh, focus here because we're kind of mapping all the interviews together and look what people think about. Okay, coloring textiles, what Rika has been doing and it's, it's kind of, there is research done uh, somehow, but really kind of empirical studies on, on, on biocolors, it's, it's less. So let's see what the consumers think. Meaning of colors in everyday life. It's not only the traffic light, but if we, think, we, we then start to discuss about more detail in this topic, and of course we were, because we were so ignorant as researchers, we thought that the consumers, just ordinary people are as well. And usually they say that I haven't never thought about, about colors, you know, the origin, you know, in, in the package, in the clothing, where it's coming from. It's more like an aesthetic and, and it's there, but I, I don't know where it's coming. So, and then the, I have the, the second um, quotation, which is interesting, and it's about food package. It's, it's kind of the color is outside of the package. And then we realize that it's because it's so thin, it's, it's a surface of, of food stuff or clothes. People, of course, it's, you cannot se sense the color as such, only if you are allergic to the color, then you, it's inching and then you realize that there is something there. But of course they start, start then thinking about toxic, non-toxic, and, and then they have ideas about synthetic colors and bio colors. Uh, but again, th this origin of the colors was the most uh, kind of discussed topic in a way that they start thinking about, I never thought about it, and wh wh where these colors are coming from. And um, there's a, the, the third quotation is interesting because he's saying that he doesn't see color as a raw material in that sense. So it's kind of, it doesn't exist. It's, you, you have to really force your ideas to, 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 okay, visually we see it, but it's like where is coming to our life? What are, kind of origin of the food is really important. Is it local food? Is it coming from... Um, uh, which country and so forth, but not in the color as such. But of course, there's a, also a lot of opportunities, as, as Julia said um, this afternoon, that you know what, what we can do with these colors and, and make people to, to wear it more. So, and then biocolors, yes, but 
Of course, they associate biocolors, uh, environmental friendly and kind of positive uh, adject adjectives, and then synthetic was industrialized and, and so forth, but they didn't discuss about oil that much, I think. It's, it's like kind of uh, ordinary people's idea what is inside of these biocolors. Of course, those who have more handicraft background, they could kind of discuss more in, in detail. But it's, of course, it's a nice thing if you say that it's, it could be sustainable and it's, it's, it's one new kind of um, invention to the consumer market. But then they start thinking about, of course, that it's a manufacturer who decides whether they are taking it or not and, how, and what is the price. That's always an issue for consumers, even if it doesn't really matter if it's one cent or ten cents in, in the way if you want to buy some product. But that's what the people are usually uh, thinking. And again, they are thinking about this origin of the colors. Where in the world these pure colors are produced or the synthetic colors, they, they don't know it. Of course, we don't know either if we think about uh, our fridge or car or whatever consumer items, we don't know where the components are coming. Only local food, we have some sort of, okay, it's coming 80 kilometers on that direction. Then we know where the, the content is coming. But also, it's also wrapped and packaged, packed as well. So, and then this recycling, it's, uh, it, it's an interesting thing because it's so, it has been so many decades there already that, okay, even if we haven't really recycled so many items at home, but it's, it's very known phenomenon for consumers if we think about sustainability and, and these kind of issues. So they kind of started to combine this recycling and packages and colors. And, um, and then they, as you can see, you, they have also ideas on how, how the machines are separating different things. And it has been uh, quite, a, I think, discussion about this black color and black food packages that should we put in the plastic container or, or, or somewhere else, and are they recyclable and, and all this stuff. But then if we look the other two quotations, it's, it's getting interesting, the story, because then they start thinking about life cycle of the package. It's like, okay, if, the, if they're really strongly colored, can I reuse, reuse it, or are they recyclable, for example? That's a new thing. I never thought about it. I don't have an answer, and the chemistry uh, researchers can, can give an answer in the, in the end. And then they also discuss about this matter of recycling, that there is no that much talk about colors. So it's, it's for, usually the colors are signaling something like, like traffic lights or, you know, some sport team that I relate to this brand or this idea, but not as a, as a material, it's, it's not uh, discussed. So as a conclusion, what we can learn from this um, journey that we have already done is that consumers, of course, hasn't been thinking colors in that way, that where are they coming, uh, this origin of colors, the production, who is doing it, where, how, which are synthetic, which are biocolor. But they start thinking about this when you start discussing about it, that, you know, are they toxic or non-toxic, or they have some own experiences in mean, some materials and so forth. But if kind of thinking about this, you know, if you look this, for example, this pizza box example that, you know, it, it doesn't hit to the food or, or where the color is, is going in the food packages, and then it's, of course, it's the safetyness and healthiness. It's always for consumers, it's, it's, if, it's, if it's threatening my, my existence and my well-being, or is it dangerous, then you start thinking about, and it's, it's becoming an important issue. So nobody is going to buy a milk in the grocery store thinking about, is this color going to my milk that I, I'm uh, pouring and, and drinking afterwards? But I think this is the thing that we should study more, this, because health and, and safety, is to, they could be similar things, but they do different kind of categories, and, and what, what we can uh, kind of learn more when we analyze it in further. But then recycling, recycling and recycling, because it's part of the responsible behavior of consumers. Uh, and, and when you're combining it into the bio colors, which consumers doesn't, ordinary people doesn't know that much. Uh, 
maybe that's an interesting thing that it's if we want to kind of it's a one way to to discuss with the consumers with colors and bio colors it's it's through recycling because it's so familiar for them uh, and uh, kind of if i'm quoting the the consumers that we have been interviewing that if packages are recycled why not the colors and i don't know even are they i don't know what happens to them but i think it's a good question so uh, as a consumer researcher usually you are ending up having more questions than in the beginning when you started to to work and and this is something I can throw to the other scholars of this team. We, we, we cannot answer this question. That's the good side of being consumer researcher. It's you are just giving ideas and symbols and, and, and so forth. Okay, that's my part of the presentation. We, we are more like still very early stage of, of this topic because it's a bit challenging. Thank you. References. Thank you so much, Minna. Uh, this was, uh, again, another very interesting perspective on uh, colors and materials and something that is still in the beginning of, uh, of being researched and a very yes. important topic as well. Um, at the moment, we don't have any uh, questions yes. at presemo.helsinki.fi <laughs> slash biocolor, but if you still have something to ask there online at home, you can send a question there. Uh, I want to ask if, if our live audience has some questions for Minna. Rika doesn't. Yes. That's a good question. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I think people are just think, you know, they because they don't know the what happens to the food packages or clothes, you know, after using. We just get rid of them, and then the industry again takes kind of power how how they do it. But I, that's the question I was thinking. That is it. I don't know how it. Uh, Rika can give you an answer. I'm posing the question. I cannot answer. So Rika, <laughs> you have a microphone. Uh, yes, um, I can partly answer that. I know already that there has been recycling colors um, uh, with textiles. If the textiles are sorted according to their color, it's possible to do new yarn from the colored textiles and then use that. And they don't need further dyeing. But uh, I don't know about packaging materials, mm. since usually in packages the there is much less uh, color because the, the packaging, it might be on the surface only. Mm. Well, mm. there are some, some um, thoroughly, thoroughly colored packages though. So but maybe but plastics you could um, also recycle according to um, color. But if they recycle, to, like now we have synthetic colors and so do you know what happens? You know, when they recycle the plastic, you know, the color is, is it kind of... It in, in most cases, the melting points of plastics is lower than the, um, for the colorants. So the colorants are more stable and they will uh, remain to, throughout the process. Okay. So this might be an is issue with the, also with the biodegradable uh, plastics or products mm. that might have colorants that are not biodegradable, for example. And we also have a, not question, but good comment here uh, at Presemo uh, saying that recycling colors can be less sustainable than not recycling them. So uh, potentially those processes could be more, mm. uh, more harmful. This might be something that we don't know yet, but I, yeah. I think it's a good... Comment. Yeah, good comment. Thank you. Yes, yes, thank you so much, Minna. Thank you. <laughs> and now it's time for our last presentation, um, continuing a bit with the same theme uh, of packagings and colors, but from a different perspective. So, um, welcome, Kai Lankinen, uh, Executive 
partner of Marvako, one of uh, Biocolor Project's uh, business partners. And uh, Lankinen will present the theme of increasing sustainability in packaging printing. So welcome, Kai. You are <laughs> free to share your presentation. Okay. Hello from... Uh, can you hear me now? Can yes. you hear me now? Yes, we okay. can hear you. Yeah, good. So, uh, greeting from uh, Dresden, Germany to everybody. And uh, it was nice to see in Martin's presentation that uh, you had been visiting Dresden and there was the ele elector suit presented. I have to see if there are a couple of those around here still. And um, also, you were uh, speaking about wood and uh, welt, uh, blue and yellow colors, and I'm retouching those also. Likewise, uh, best regards to Minna. Once again, it was uh, nice to hear about packaging and all that was connected to that. And uh, those two things are connected in my presentation. So how, how uh, Biocolor project, uh, how can we increase sustainability, if, if possible, in packaging printing? And uh, a couple of words about Marvako. We are a solution provider for printers, both printers and brand owners. So we are uh, between the advertisement agency and the printing, uh, executing uh, the repro work, which is modificating the, the design uh, to be printed um, and making the printing plates so that it can be printed um, in a best way. And here we are in a place to select uh, the best possible way, even the more um, ecological way when possible to print. We are uh, executing about 30,000 jobs uh, per year to all uh, kind of printing methods. And as you see, we have several locations in Europe, Northern Europe. The importance of the uh, color project is, is of course that uh, the uh, packaging companies are looking for sustainable production possibilities. The consumers are concerned, we all are concerned about uh, the our environment and the future of it. And to um, this also, uh, all uh, FMCG companies, so brand owners, fast moving consumer goods companies are looking solutions to offer to consumers. Typically, this has been the question of uh, packaging materials and the selection of materials. And it's uh, pretty difficult to say uh, which is more ecological finally and, and so on. And uh, at Marvako, we have been working for greener printing. It's, it's our brand name uh, to offer the similar kind of a result, a very good high, high quality result, but uh, even in a more uh, sustainable way. And uh, due to that, uh, I was very thankful being asked uh, to join the Biocolor project and uh, to see what can we still do to improve the, the uh, sustainability. Different parts of the world, uh, packaging is printed with different methods. Typically, there is also Flexo, and Flexo is the one, Flexo printing is one method uh, to be raising all the time. And uh, gravure is there, but it's uh, decreasing, and then there are other ones, uh, depending on the materials, uh, uh, offset and digital and so on. But we can typically say that uh, Flexo printing is the most typical way of printing. How the uh, color is made uh, to the packaging also, not, not only to the um, clothes and so on, but uh, typically uh, the image is uh, CMYK, which is uh, containing cyan color, magenta color, yellow and black, which are separated into different color units. And then there are so-called spot colors, whenever needed uh, some specific brand colors or so. This is traditional production of packaging printing and the um, current uh, modern uh, way is um, moving more to process color printing. So no need to change colors, no need to mix colors, but keeping the all colors fixed in the, in the process. Typically, uh, when possible, CM, CMYK, cyan, magenta, yellow and black are the um, initial colors. 
and whenever going to expand and make uh, colors more uh, vivid and more colorful, the packaging in process printing, we take orange, green, and violet. So there, uh, therefore, it was very interesting to hear uh, Martin's presentation, and, and um, hopefully we will find ways uh, to see how this will work in, in packaging. So far, uh, the biocolor test pigments that we are uh, looking for is, is a wood, which is Morsinko in, in Finnish, uh, that we have been doing together with Natural, Natural Indigo Finland. And we are uh, looking for this cyan, cyan color. Yellow uh, is, of course, uh, interesting, whether it's a uh, welt or something else, that we could uh, use uh, blue and yellow to make uh, green and the tints of green and turquoise. Uh, whenever the, the magenta or red uh, could be possible, um, it should be uh, light resistant and all, all that. Then we could uh, make the more complete uh, color gamut. Let's see what we can do. Black is, of course, uh, needed typically also to the packaging. So let's start with the wood. And uh, this this is uh, what, what we are planning to test. Uh, we have sent uh, uh, samples to the ink laboratory, and um, it's a plant-based indigo color, so-called indigo color, color, blue color. And Pasi Aina Soja has been developing um, this process in, in Finland for many years, how to produce more natural, ethical, uh, sustainable way uh, bio pigments. Uh, asset, it's uh, obtained from the leaves of the wood plant, um, and this is grown in, in Nivala, Finland. And ob obviously, the long summer days are very suitable for this, um, this plant. It has been used so far, uh, as we saw, uh, in textiles and fashion garment. And uh, let's see uh, whether it shall work in the packaging printing also. Traditionally, uh, the spot colors uh, have been made uh, one, one ink by one ink. And uh, in the uh, printing houses, ink stock, there can be even 450 um, or 500, 600 different colors in, in a, um, a storage. And this is, of course, all wasted time and potential waste of uh, uh, ink and resources. And therefore, uh, if possible, if it would be possible to print only CMYK process colors, then uh, we would get uh, rid of all the other colors and uh, get along with only four colors, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. But the, uh, the um, opposite of this is that we only cover 55% of the all those uh, typically used uh, shades, color shades, uh, so-called Pantone matching system shades, Pantone colors, and therefore we would need additional uh, expanded gamut, so enlarged color space colors like uh, orange, green, and violet. And then we would be um, pretty close to cover up um, all possible needs of the um, colors. But uh, of course, uh, there are challenges uh, in uh, in printing uh, in with biocolorants, and uh, we we'll, we shall see what all will be realized. The first thing is, of course, as Mina already said, the, the price. The price of the uh, pigments is is typically higher um, than uh, in in biocolorants than uh, the currently used uh, colors. Then, um, when the price is not an issue, the next question is that uh, the printing industry and um, uh, printing would need uh, a huge amount of those those uh, pigments. So uh, quickly, we are in an issue that uh, we would need such amounts that uh, there is no supplier for those those uh, amounts of thousands thousands of kilos and uh, tens of thousands of kilos of, of uh, pigments. So um, that we will see how to, how to deal with that, and of course um, the designs can be 
create it in a way that uh, it fits to the packaging and uh, uh, will serve the meaning. Then uh, we are printing with uh, water-based inks, uh, solvent-based inks, uh, or the printers are printing with water-based, solvent-based, or oil-based inks. And the uh, dyes or the pigments should be suitable, of course, to, to that uh, uh, mixture. When that's done, then uh, the print quality should be good enough. And uh, we hope to uh, print high resolution images so that uh, there is some, some uh, real use for the, uh, these inks. Color strength uh, would be nice to have so that the more, more strength uh, we have in the colors, the higher um, uh, color density we can have, which means uh, enlarging the color space, color gamut, so that we, we can get all different kind of colors. And of course, the resistance for properties, as, as Martin was all, also uh, saying, it's not only the last fastness and, and how long it will be uh, without fading the, uh, the color itself. It's only the, also the uh, rub resistance and all the other that it shouldn't get uh, rid of uh, from the packaging. At first, uh, our target is to test uh, wood uh, from uh, natural indigo Finland in water-based inks uh, on paper. And um, then uh, let's see what shall come out from there. Uh, as, as speaking about greener printing, we have also done uh, a global warming potential study based on the ISO 14067 standard, which is greenhouse gases, uh, carbon footprint of products. And uh, of course, currently there are ways of making the uh, printing process more ecological and to reduce the CO2 equivalent in printing process. And um, when possible, uh, what, what would be the role of uh, biocolorants? We, we shall see that as an extra benefit. To this process. Why the expanded Kamut EGP process is then greener printing? It's uh, because it already uses less ink uh, than the spot color, traditional spot color printing. And therefore, it's, it would be very suitable uh, to printing with uh, bio, bio colorants also. Less uh, solvent use, which is always good. Less process waste of colors of material, eliminated ink waste, less setup time for substrate, um, less ink storage and the number of ink bins, smaller plate, printing plates, less plates in a, in a combination run and so on. So all in all, less printing press energy also used. This is possible all uh, today. And of course, combining this with um, biocolorants is an interesting step. The jobs, what we have done, uh, with uh, the expanded Kamut printing are very, very colorful, as, as you see. Typically, uh, there are uh, used uh, five to six colors only, uh, or maximum seven colors. And with these seven colors, um, cyan, magenta, yellow, black, orange skin, violet, uh, we are able to produce images that the printers can print uh, very colorfully. So all in all, um, this method uh, is very potential for uh, biocolorants where, where uh, we don't need a huge amount of uh, different different colors. So uh, that's a quick and brief presentation about uh, packaging printing and how to make it more eco-efficient. And uh, now, are there any questions? Thank you so much, Kai, already at this point uh, for this interesting presentation and uh, giving uh, a view of the future, probably, that uh, what, what uh, packaging with biodice could be. I'm looking if we have some questions online at presemo.helsinki.fi slash biocolor. Not at this moment, but there might be some questions appearing. Do you have some questions here at Think Corner? Yes. 
the Riikka Raisanen. Perhaps if you want, you can come here. Uh, actually, Kai okay. can't hear okay. it from there. If you want to present the question directly, speaking okay. towards here. Hello, Kai. Thanks for your great presentation. Uh, it came to my, my mind that um, it would be possible to produce um, blue, red, uh, yellow and black, as we learned from um, Martin's presentation. But if the shades are not similar as your smug colors, so um, would you create a biocolor palette for your printing with this Flexo? It wouldn't look I mean, like your smug printing, but maybe something else. What do you think of yes. that? Um, uh, we are profiling the printing press, and then we will see the, what is the, the color space, how the color space and color comut will be. And from this color space, we can uh, select and uh, we can simulate on beforehand which colors we can produce. And um, of course, the, I, I'm, I'm not expecting that the first uh, colors would be very strong and very, very uh, dense in, in the color strength. But uh, as Minna said, it's, it's already, according to my opinion, getting something out, uh, starting with the blue, even if, uh, if it's a bit light blue, I'm, I'm very happy uh, with that. And then combining the different colors and uh, the would be yellow and cyan uh, bringing green. And also that uh, we are in Reprohouse, we are balancing uh, the gray balance. And based on that, we shall create then uh, the images as it comes, even though it might be look like an old postcard at first, but <laughs> let's start with something. Well, that sounds good to me. <laughs> Thank you. Let's see if there are some questions, not online at the moment, but actually we received one question already beforehand. Uh, this might be a question that <laughs> we can't answer yet, but I'm going to ask it anyway. So someone uh, asked that uh, they are printing wallpaper by hand and by printer, and they are interested uh, if these biocolors could be used for printers at home, I, I suppose. So. Uh, are they light fast enough? What kind of paper is needed? These might be things that we don't know yet, but do you have some speculations, for example, about uh, whether biocolorants could be used in uh, home printers, if you know something about that? In, in principle, it should be a similar kind of a um, dye, so it, it should be possible. Uh, Martin knows more about the light fastness during the yeah. 100 years, uh, so... <laughs> Printing on a paper is an, is a, I would say, it's, it's an uh, easy task. Uh, printing on plastic uh, or coated, um, coated uh, cardboard is, is something else then. But uh, printing on paper, water-based, um, is, is like an easy uh, start. Mm, yeah. Could be possible, but it's not yet possible. Yeah, yeah. And maybe could be possible already with some... Um uh, craftier methods of printing wallpaper, perhaps. <laughs> okay, now we have one question here online. So, uh, what drives you as company in this development? Uh, what price what? Uh, what drives you as company in this development towards uh, using biocolorants, I assume? Uh, now I didn't get that one important word. What was what uh, was the important word? Uh, what? What drives you as company uh -huh. in this development? Okay, that's a, that's a good uh, thing. Um, uh, close of, close to my heart, uh, I'm one of the owners of the company, and close to my heart is uh, making something beneficial. So uh, if we can if we can make the change. So then we should make the change. And we have found this. Actually, I've been doing my doctoral uh, study uh, about this topic during the last 15 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's becoming ready now uh, uh, in a couple of months uh, uh, for the publication. So uh, I, that's, that's driving that we could do something for the, uh, which is more ecological when we need anyhow packaging. 
And um, currently we have only losing losing money with all these tests, and it's it's not been um, anything great source of the of the money. But it's been a piece of the mind, and for the it it brings us. I believe that it brings us uh, to the future, staying alive and being there, making that uh, different thing to happen. Mm. That's a good conclusion and drive for all this research, I would say. Many of the researchers can sign those thoughts as well. I'm looking at the clock and we are <laughs> coming to the end of this seminar. So, uh, okay, now I saw that there's one question. I see if it's uh, like compact enough to be answered. Mm. Okay, I think we have time for this. So, um, in general, do you see any connection between the selection of the colors and the content of the package? Should the colors communicate, not only look? In in uh, many cases, uh, the color needs to um, be representative uh, for the for the um, product. So, um, if we take an orange juice. As, as an example, so of course it would be something obviously towards orange and towards green. Um, so may, maybe not only black. Uh, so of course uh, these are. But uh, I would I would think be thinking that uh, there are also many other uh, products and food packaging uh, to be used at first and. Uh, and uh, uh, when it's by a color and it's communicated that this package uh, contains uh, by a colorant, so then it's uh, uh, forgiven a lot. But we will see how it how it goes. But actually, mm -hmm. I would have a one one uh, question to to Martin. So as I see that Martin is there, yeah, uh, if online, Martin so is still online, Mar Martin. Uh, <laughs> Martin, uh, how easy it is to, to produce the uh, cyan uh, magenta, uh, uh, cyan uh, magenta yellow, black, uh, and orange green violet uh, for for printing purposes? Uh, <laughs> good question. I know I know how you uh, can get this color on textiles, uh, but it 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 uh, reminds me of one of the uh, questions which was asked to you. Uh, uh, can you make all colors uh, available? I think that uh, with the colorants we have, uh, particularly a little bit more the stronger colors, such as belt and matter, and maybe cochineal, which is used as a food uh, colorant and is already investigated and seems to be pretty safe. Uh, and the blue, I think you can, uh, particularly by mixing the colors, uh, get quite far. I think that uh, compared to synthetic colorants, which are in general brighter, uh, it will be very difficult to get uh, to very bright colors. Uh, but maybe you can also think a little bit of, uh, it will be of course ideal if you can get to a fully biocolor product. But even if we are able to reduce the amount of uh, uh, synthetic colorants by let's say 50%, that will be a huge difference. I think that you cannot even produce that many uh, much uh, colorants. Uh, I think they can, uh, it is definitely worthwhile investigating. Uh, I think the ambition at the end will be using uh, all bio colors, but I think that you will have some limitations getting certain colors and uh, but maybe mixing both natural and synthetics would be uh, also a way to go. And of course, one of the issues I do not know, and that also is related to this question about how to apply this as a print on uh, on paper, depends also a little bit of what kind of demand you have. Uh, in cultural heritage, we hope to preserve the colors forever. But a food packaging material, which is stored in the dark, uh, then uh, exposed in the, in the shop, so to say, and normally the same day opened or the day after opened and thrown away. Uh, should we care that much about light fastness? I think that the fastness is, is a bigger problem as a matter of fact. So we can see, well, what do we actually need? And can we, uh, what can we sacrifice for it? 
Yes, thanks. Uh, I think that uh, when there is a, a printability, we can uh, certainly find products uh, that are um, suitable for this this kind of a uh, color space. Okay, yeah. okay good. Okay. Uh, one thing I have, uh, so uh, Martin, welcome to Tristan and everybody else. So please be proud of uh, wearing your masks. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kai, <laughs> and Martin as well. Now, our program is very in the end. Uh, I just want to thank you for participating online and here at Think Corner and having very interesting conversation. It seems that these topics uh, could be discussed a lot more, so let's continue interacting with each other and uh, discussing about these matters. If you are interested in Biocolor Project, uh, please follow us on, on our channels to get information about how the project proceeds, what kind of results we are getting and how you can get involved in future events and workshops, for example. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.